Greetings all, my name is Kari Aikman, and today I'd like to share with you the work that I've done on assessing the feasibility of automating stock market manipulation. This is work done at Georgia Tech, along with my peers, Simon, Urkham, Sai, Brendan, and Wanky. So markets have been around for several centuries, and they have changed a lot over the years as a result of advances in technology. But one thing that's remained persistent is the presence of fraud. So the problem that we wanted to look at in this work is whether it would be possible for a botnet malware to automate stock market manipulation. And consequently, what exactly would these bots automate? How would they do the automation? How would they communicate with each other? Who would they be compromising? And how would the bot master evade detection? So the agenda for today's talk is I want to impart on you some knowledge about how layering manipulation works, which we identify to be particularly suitable for automation by malware, what are the current defenses used by brokerages and exchanges and why these are inadequate for detecting such a malware, how such a malware would work, what the impact on the market would be, and what the future is for this work. So starting at the top, some basic market uh, some basic market mechanics. We have a buyer and a seller who want to buy and sell shares, and they use an exchange to do so. And the way the exchange keeps track of orders is using something called an order book, which we need to dig into in order to understand how layering works. So this is what an order book looks like. We have the bids and the asks to buy and sell the stock. We have the spread, which is the gap between the best bid and the best ask. And then we have layers, and each of these layers show how many shares are available at each price for the stock. So the way that a perpetrator can abuse the order book in order to commit fraud is shown in an example like this. On the left we have bids, on the right we have asks, and at each layer I'm showing how many volume or how many shares are available. Something that a malicious trader could do is they could create spoof orders, which are orders that they create uh, without the intent of ever actually letting them execute, and place them all on one side of the book, thereby creating pressure, in this case, pressure that makes it look like there are many sellers, and then they place the real bid on the other side of the book. So in this case, 25 shares to buy the stock. The other traders seeing this uh, uneven book and this pressure think that there are more sellers and that the price is going to go down. So they place their own sells and this causes the price to eventually go down. And then when the uh, perpetrators legitimate orders execute to buy the shares, they then cancel all their spoof orders. So consequently, they only pay the price for the bids and they were able to buy at a lower price than if they hadn't spoofed. Spoofing is illegal in the US, but because roughly 85% of uh, orders that get made on the markets end up being canceled, it's actually very hard to distinguish the intent of traders. And once you introduce something like a malware, which can distribute spoofing over a large number of compromise accounts, the potential for manipulation goes up significantly. So what are the current defenses at the brokerages and why are these inadequate? Um, so in the previous diagram, I showed the buyer or the seller in the exchange, but there's a few other parties involved in between. The seller doesn't talk directly to the exchange. They instead talk to a brokerage. Um, and then the brokerage has a collection of brokers who they forward orders to to buy and sell. And the brokers bundle those together and bring them to the exchange. The brokerage to prevent fraud has anomaly detection on the accounts looking for changes in trading behavior, two-factor authentication to prevent things like phishing and notifications to let users know of important events. The exchange also has an anomaly detector looking at the overall market. The problem is in the presence of something like a malware distributing uh, layering trades, the first problem is that the brokerage level, the anomaly detection is done on a per user account. So as you distribute the malicious transactions over more and more accounts and potentially across multiple brokerages, their view of the situation becomes too incomplete to detect the problem. Similarly, um, while two-factor authentication can stop uh, phishing, one this is an optional option, so a lot of users uh, don't enable it. 
And then two, a lot of users engage in algorithmic or automated trading for benign purposes, and this is fundamentally incompatible with two-factor, which requires a human to be present. And then lastly, we discover that notifications by default are delivered by email, and some important events do not produce emails. Uh, when we tested the major American brokerages, such as a new, uh, a new browser logging in. And then at the exchange, the problem is that the anomaly detection is global. Um, so since they see the orders once they've been aggregated together by the broker, they can see large scale anomalous movements, but they can't actually distinguish individual traders, which could otherwise help them detect fraud. So long story short, what we found is that the incomplete view that uh, each party has makes them poorly suited to detect uh, to detect layering when it's distributed at large scale. And then there's also the government, which we'll briefly come back to at the end. So how would a trading malware work? So we actually built a proof of concept malware. It, look, it works very similarly to a banking Trojan and it works by taking over the user's browser to get access to their email and their brokerage site. And then it's able to uh, place orders while making sure that the emails uh, corresponding to those events don't get delivered to the user's devices, um, and then also edit the history if the user tries to check it through the browser, and more details are in the paper. So what would the impact of such a malware be? So simulating this kind of malware is difficult because it's designed to have an impact on the price of the stock. So we can't use historical data. Instead, we need a agent-based simulation that allows agents to have a fundamental belief about what the stock is worth and then come to a conclusion about whether to buy or sell accordingly. And our simulation also needs to account for factors like the computation time and network latency. So I don't have time to go into a lot of the details about how our simulation works, but one thing I'll briefly explain is how agents form a belief on value. So the way that that works is that we have exchange agents and we have something called a belief oracle. So the exchange provides the trader or the trading agent with information on the state of the order book. And then the belief oracle has the true fundamental value of the stock. And when the agent tries to query the belief oracle for its value, it gets a noisy reading. So as a result, we have a collection of agents. They all have slightly different beliefs on what the stock is worth, but they're all relatively uh, close to an agreement with each other. And then based on the order book and their belief of the value, they can then place orders accordingly. So we ran this simulation over a couple thousand different settings. And some of the things that we discovered is one, the attack duration to actually perform layering can be less than a minute, which is consistent with what we saw in SEC case files for real world prosecutions of layering scams. The network tolerance is actually quite high in this botnet because there's not a lot of communication required to conduct the attack. So even when we make the bots three times slower than other background traders, they can still perform their layering successfully. The required trade volume for the botnet to have an impact on the stock price is only 1.5%, which in practice is only a few thousand dollars even for large uh, stocks. And the per session return on investment is 2.8%, which is not particularly high, but when you consider how quick the attack is, even if you only conducted one layering attack per day, that's an annual return on investment of over 1,000%. So if you take a stock, for example, like IBM, and you have about $5,000 for the botnet to use, you can take an initial investment of about $100,000, and the bot master can turn that into a million dollars after one year. The other thing that we found very interesting is that the cost of the botnet is only the commission fees, which are either small or non-existent in modern brokerages, and the orders that were intended to be spoofs, but somehow accidentally executed, which tends to be really small if the botnet is working well, even with high latency. So the consequence is that the botmaster's profit significantly outweighs the botnet's costs, 
and thus achieves a self-sustaining uh, design where not only does the bot master profit, but if he wants to, he could even allow the bots themselves to profit, or in other words, the victims, creating this very interesting cycle. So lastly, I'll wrap up by talking about the future for this research. So first of all, mandating two-factor authentication is not a viable solution to something like a stock uh, manipulating malware, because as I mentioned, there's plenty of uh, legitimate benign reasons for algorithmic trading, and algorithmic trading is incompatible with two-factor. Similarly, the solution is not as simple as just making brokerages do more anomaly detection because, as I said, they have an incomplete picture of what's going on in the markets, and as and something like a uh, malware could be distributed across several brokerages. Uh, they could improve their alerting by making sure to alert users of new logins, which could uh, provide an early indicator of a malware trying to scope out their accounts. And then lastly, on the government side, um, there has been work on what's called the consolidated audit trail, which would bring together some data sources to make it easier to get a holistic picture of the market. Um, we go into a lot of details about how this works in the paper, but I don't have time to discuss it here. Uh, similarly, there's a lot of other details in the paper, which unfortunately I don't have time to get into in this talk. Um, for example, we do a lot of in-depth case studies of SEC case files, and we use that as evidence to back up all of our conclusions based on real instances of fraud. Um, we look at dark web market uh, listings to get an idea of how many accounts are being hacked and what the cost is for an attacker to break into such an account and so forth. So I would encourage you to read the paper, and I'm happy to take questions or comments. Thank you.